kind of knowledge here in the physical material world and it's what is known as ascending and descending knowledge. Ascending knowledge is a knowledge that you can access through your physical senses. This is the knowledge that you can find in any library. Or just get on the internet. You can get plenty of ascending knowledge. In the final analysis, you're always going to have some imperfection in this ascending knowledge. The other kind of knowledge you have here in the physical material world it is what is known as descending knowledge. This is the knowledge that comes from the life-giving creative spirit through a human instrument that is known as a prophet then is universally made available to the rest of humanity. This is perfect knowledge. This descending knowledge. These are the two kind of knowledge that you have here in the physical material world. When you understand the difference between these two particular kind of knowledge, descending and ascending knowledge, then you will understand the difference between revealed scripture and traditional scripture between a prophet and an apostle, between imperfection and perfection. Descending knowledge is perfect knowledge. This is what the revealed scripture is. This is what the prophets in the Old Testament always said, thus said the Lord to let you know right off the bat that this wasn't coming from them. This was coming from the life-giving creative spirit. They were just an instrument. The 17th chapter of the book of Revelation and the 5th verse. And up on her forehead was a name written Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. The Gospel according to Matthew, the 12th chapter in the 41st verse. The men's of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preachings of Jonah, and behold, a greater than Jonah is here. The topic of our discussion is a rack and the repentance of Nineveh. Peace be upon you. May the peace and blessings of the life-giving Creative spirit be upon you and upon your family. My name is Melvin Ishmael Johnson. I am about to discuss with you the situation in Iraq. But let me just point out something to you. The information you are about to hear it's not the news reports that you're going to see on uh, the TV, the media, the mass media. That's under the control of the Prince of mid -air. The radio waves and the Messiah Jesus explain to you in uh, the scripture who is in control of the Prince of mid -air. But in this particular tape, I'm going to explain to you the situation in Babylon, in Iraq, from what the scriptures say, what the revealed scriptures say. You see, it's important for you to understand that it's two uh, religious systems running side by side here in the physical material world. 
one religious system that comes from God, that comes from a life-giving creative spirit through what uh, is called the male Chisenekian system of high priest kingship. This is the real religion for here on planet Earth. It's sometimes called the religion of Abraham. Now the reason it's called uh, the religion of Abraham is because uh, even though you look out on the modern scene today and you see three major religions of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, the bottom line is that they are the same religion. And the fact that Abraham, the reason they call it the religion of Abraham is because all three of these major religions trace their roots spiritually and physically through the prophet Abraham. Now this is one strain of a religion that we have uh, running on uh, planet Earth. The other one that runs with this is a false religious system. And this religious system has Satan, Shaitan as his head. And this religious system is prevalent in our midst today. And this is what I'm going to talk to you about. This is where I quote from the, we open with the 17th chapter of the book of Revelation. Because this points out when it said, upon her forehead was a name written, Babylon, the mystery of iniquity, made all of the nations of the earth drunk with the wine of her fornication. Now this is our indicator of this false religious system that's in our midst today. This is the center point of all of the confusion and the bloodshed that you see in our midst today. This false religious system is known as the Babylonian mystery of iniquity. And when I uh, get through explaining to you, uh, uh, discussing various historical in uh, uh, information in this particular tape, then it would be clear to you where that false religious system lies here in our midst today in the physical material world. The esoteric meaning of upon her forehead means that in the latter days, the time period right now that we live in, the Babylonian mystery of iniquity, this false religious system, would be put on her forehead so all with eyes to see would know where the Babylonian religious system is located. I want to read you a verse from the book of Revelation. And I will come back to this verse later on in our discussion and connect it to something that will make you understand what the Messiah Jesus meant when he said in John 8.32, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Let's read Revelation 9, the 12th chapter and the 9th verse. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels was cast out with him. Now keep Revelation 12, 9 in mind as we continue our discussion about Iraq and the repentance of Nineveh. Let's start with uh, let's start with Iraq, and let's start with the real name of this particular area from a scriptorial point of view. Bottom line, Iraq is Babylon. This is the scripture scriptorial Babylon. Before I get into the history of Babylon, let's let's break down the word Babylon, Babel. Now, this particular word uh, reached us in the English language form, of course, through the Greek civilization, etc., like that, with the meaning of confusion. 
But if you trace it a little farther back, we see that the Greeks uh, uh, used to call it chaos. Chaos. That's how we got it in the English language as confusion. So chaos and confusion, same word. Now, the origin of that word chaos in the Sumerian language, who are we talking about? We're talking about Cush. That's what the word is. Cush, chaos, and confusion is the same uh, word. So Cush is Babylon. That's it. So when we're talking about Iraq and all of that, we're talking about Cush. Now who is Cush? Now we Cush is the oldest son of Kim. Now Kim is somebody that they have really, really worked on that name in the English language to keep you from knowing anything about Kim. Because this is a very important word, Kim. This is the esoteric symbol, the esoteric icon for scientific knowledge. This word Kim. This is where we get the word chemistry from. But what do they do with, uh, for us in the English language, in the Western language, when they try to hide this from us? They switch this word to one of the most foulest animals that you can think of, the human garbage disposal suit, the pig, the ham. So they call this word ham to keep us from making uh, the connection. So uh, Kim is the correct name, and this is an esoteric icon for scientific knowledge. Kim, uh, oldest son, was Kush. And you would see in the history books, they would interchangeably uh, use the word the Kemetic or Kushite Empire. Now, how did all of this lead up to Babylon, to that area over there now, Iraq, where we see so much madness going on? so much infighting, so much blood being shed by our young men from all over the world. And so why Babylon? I'll tell you why. If you believe in the revealed scripture, and I know you do, scripture is being fulfilled before our eyes. This is why I also open uh, with the scripture of uh, the men of Nineveh. This is what the Messiah Jesus said, the men of Nineveh shall rise up in judgment of this generation and condemn it because they repented at the preachings of Jonah. One greater than Jonah was there. Now keep in mind, what, what, what is Nineveh? We're talking about the same place. It was still, when they say Nineveh, this is just Babylon. Because Nineveh was, means the habitation of Ninus. That's the meaning of it. And Ninus was Nimrod, the mighty hunter, the founder of the Babylonian Empire, which I, I would get into in a few minutes. And you can't uh, really talk about Nineveh with, without uh, talking about Jonah. Because Jonah is the one that was sent to warn the Nineveh. And for this generation, the sign of Jonah, remember something else Messiah Jesus said, the only sign I give you is the sign of the prophet Jonah. And the sign of Jonah for this generation is the descendants of the slaves of America, the African American. Right now I'm getting ready to tell you about an individual that is at the center point of all the disciples. Oh, you probably heard his name and if at all, or if you read the scripture, his title and his name is mentioned in the scripture. Uh, let's take a trip back in history. Uh, let's go to a time before the event of conventional warfare, when the animals of the earth was at constant conflict with human beings as if they knew it was the activities of human beings that had caused the catastrophe of the flood to come upon the earth. In the area where early mankind lived, where the early human beings lived, 
you had some of the most vicious animals on the earth. The lions, the tigers, the poisonous snakes, and the various predators of the mountains. But the most vicious and ferocious of all the animals on the earth was a leopard. The leopard was a gorilla warrior. The leopard was one of the few animals that had absolutely no fear of human beings. He correctly considered them to be his enemies. The leopard had been known to track his prey for days. If wounded or uh, cornered, he was a ferocious fighter. It was by conquering the leopard and utilizing him in the hunting of the other animals that the only son of Cush would receive the name that would make him the first super warrior, the first superhero, the first superstar. That name, Nimrod. The name Nimrod is taken from the two-part Sumerian word Nim that means leopard and Rod that means to subdue or conquer. It is Nimrod whose activities in relationship to the animals of the earth will lay the foundations of the Babylonian Empire. The Babylonian religious, political, and economic system. The Babylonian mystery of iniquity. Now it is very important to understand the identity of Nimrod and mighty hunger for he is the seed of all of this idol worshiping that we see in existence today. All of these idol worshiping concepts and all of these idol worshiping holidays. Nimrod would develop the concept of fortification to deal with the wild animal population. The art of fortification would lay the foundation for the concept of Freemasonry. Nimrod would surround himself with a group of specially trained young men who he would teach the art of building forts. This would lead to the secrets of their signs and the secrets of the art of building, which is the foundation of Freemasonry. Because of Nimrod's conquering of the leopard and the development of the art of fortification and Freemasonry, his popularity would continue to increase. Nimrod was able to liberate the people from the fear of wild animals. He would become a figure of immense popularity. He would don the leopard skin, symbolic of his victory over the leopard and parade before the people. He was on his way to becoming the first super warrior the first superhero, the first superstar. Nimrod, the mighty hunter, would be worshipped as a god during his lifetime. An entire system of worship would develop around Nimrod. He would be known by many names in many nations. He would be known as Tammuz, the origin of the symbol of the cross and the same Thamud of the Quran. He would be known as Ninus, the origin of the capital city of the Assyrian Empire, known as Nineveh. The capital city of the, of the Assyrian Empire was known as Nineveh, which means the habitation of Ninus. He, was, he would be known as Bacchus and Dionysus, the two-faced god, and the entire Babylonian religious system of Cush, Seba, who is Nimrod, and Semiramis would be inherited by the Mesmerites, who are now Egypt, into the concept of Horus, Osiris, and Isis. Abraham, the father of nations, under the male Chizadek, would organize the downfall of Nimrod, the mighty hunter. This is referred to in the Quran, Surah 2, Ayah 258. 
Has that not turned the vision to one who disputed with Abraham about his Lord? Because Allah has granted him power. Abraham said, My Lord is he who gives life and death. He said, I give life and death. Said Abraham, But it is Allah that caused the sun to rise from the east. Do thou then cause him to rise from the west? Thus was he confounded, who in arrogance rejected faith. Nor does Allah give guidance to a people unjust. You see, Nimrod's inability to make the sun rise in the west would prove to the people that Nimrod was a false god. This would lead to the crucifixion and death of Nimrod the mighty hunter. This is the true origin of many of the crucifixion concepts that is true, that is seen throughout the modern day religious system that we see uh, in Western society. After the death of Nimrod, the mighty hunter, this particular system would go underground. It is why underground that will come refined and perfected and known as the Babylonian mystery of iniquity. It was also while on the ground that one last piece and the final piece of the puzzle was put in place for this idolatrous paganic system. Semiramis, who was Easter, she is the one that added the last piece. She perpetrated the myth that Nimrod, the mighty hunter, was not only a super warrior, not only a superhero, a superstar, but he had the power to overcome death itself, to rise from the dead. Now the thing that I want you to keep in mind here is that this is the origin of many of the resurrection myths that you see throughout Western society and throughout many of the pagan nations that we have upon the earth today. Now at this point, while we're talking about the concept of the resurrection, let us clear something here. Let's talk about the resurrection uh, of the Messiah, Jesus, and let's talk about it from the perspective of someone who was there, the Messiah, Jesus himself. I'm going to read to you from Luke, the 24th chapter, the 15th to the 27th verse, and it reads, and it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes was hidden that they should not know him. And he said unto them, What manner of communication are these that you have one to another as ye walk and are sad? And then one of them, whose name was Cleophas, answered, said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem? Hast not known the things which are come to pass in these days? And he said unto them, What things? And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty in deeds and word before all of the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And besides all of this, today is the third day since these things was done. Yes, and certain women also of our company made us astonish, which was early at the tomb. And when they found not his body, they came, saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. And certain of them 
which was with us went to the tomb and found it even so as the women had said, but him they saw not. Then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Luke, the 24th chapter, the 15th through the 27th verse. Now the Messiah Jesus called those who misinterpret the meaning of his resurrection fools. The next thing he did was take them back to Moses and reteach them about the meaning of the resurrection. The reason he took them back to Moses is because Moses is the foundation of the prophets like him mentioned in the book of Deuteronomy. The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me. Unto him ye shall hearken. Deuteronomy the 18th chapter and the 15th verse. And then Deuteronomy 18, 18, which reads, I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto thee, and will put my words into his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I command him. As I mentioned, that's Deuteronomy 18, 18. Now the two prophets I'm talking about is the prophet Messiah Jesus and the prophet Seal Muhammad. Another prophet that mentioned these two prophets is Isaiah 21, 7. And this reads, and he saw a chariot with a pair of horsemen, a chariot of donkeys and a chariot of camel. Isaiah 21st chapter, 7th verse. Now Jesus uh, in John 12, 14, 15, and Zechariah 9, 9, fulfilled a portion of this prophecy relating to the rider on the donkey. And John 12, uh, 12, chapter 14 through the 15th verse reads, Then Jesus, when he had found a young donkey, said on it, as it is written, Fear not of Zion, daughters of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey coat. John, the 12th chapter, the 14th and 15th verse. And then Zechariah 9, 9 reads, Rejoice greatly, O daughters of Zion. Shout, O daughters of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey. Now another point uh, to consider, another important point to consider, is that the word Moses means to draw out. For Moses was drawn out of the river. Exodus, the second chapter in the tenth verse reads, She called his name Moses, and she said, Because I drew him out of the water. Now to draw out is the root meaning for the word education. So keep in mind that the foundation for the teachings of the Messiah Jesus and the prophet Muhammad is the prophet Moses. And keep in mind the point that I mentioned earlier. The religion of the prophet Moses, the prophet Messiah Jesus, and the prophet Seal Muhammad is the same as the religion of Abraham, which is the Melchizedekian system of high priest kingship. So the resurrection of the Messiah Jesus is the true resurrection to fulfill scripture. The resurrection concept developed around Nimrod, the mighty hunter, is the false religious system, the false resurrection, and it is the center point of the Babylonian religious system. 
the resurrection of the Messiah Jesus is one of the most controversial portions of the life of the Messiah Jesus. Now to examine the meaning of the resurrection according to the words of Jesus himself, we must remember what Jesus said in his famous statement that defines who his disciples are and how to know the truth and achieve spiritual liberation. And it reads, Then Jesus said to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. John, the 8th chapter, the 31st and the 32nd verse. So those who said they followed the Messiah Jesus will stay in his words. The Messiah Jesus should be the primary authority for his teachings. Not Paul or Peter or anyone else. Now, in the Western form of the teachings of the Messiah Jesus, Paul is the authority. And later on in our discussion, I would explain to you how that happened. But the point that I would like uh, you to keep in mind is that the Messiah Jesus pointed out in his teachings that in relationship to the resurrection, he was a Jonah chronotype. Prototype. Let's read Matthew, the 12th chapter, the 39th and the 40th verse. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and no sign shall be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days in the belly of the great fish. So will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the belly of the earth. Matthew, the 12th chapter, the 39th and the 40th verse. Now, at this point, I would like to use the sign of Jonah concept to get back to our topic of Iraq and the repentance of Nineveh. As I mentioned earlier, Nineveh is Babylon, and Babylon is Iraq. Not only is Babylon Iraq, but the superpowers that the book of Revelation called that great whore that made the nations of the earth drunk with the wine of her fornication, the superpower and her allies is at this moment struggling for control of the Babylonian Empire, the Babylonian religious, political, and economic system, the Babylonian mystery of iniquity. Why is the United States and our allies dying in Mesopotamia? What's so important about this area? Now, I think it's time to slow down a little. We've been quoting scripture. Now it's time to come with the real deal. Let's take the gloves off. Time to wake up Lazarus. Remember now, Lazarus is asleep. Lazarus is not dead. Who do you think Lazarus is? Lazarus is the same sign of Jonah that the Messiah Jesus talked about. That's the only sign that he gave. He said, the only sign that I give to an evil and a daughter's generation is the sign of the prophet Jonah. And I constantly tell you that the sign of Jonah for this generation, the time period that we live in, is the descendants of the slaves of America. And let me clarify something at this point so we can start off on the right point. It's very important to understand that 
The prophecy in Genesis 15, 13 that talk about 14, 400 years of slavery is to be able to pinpoint the beginning of slavery for the descendants of Abraham. And what is this uh, beginning period? As we know, the Atlantic slave trade that, most, that brought most of the descendants of the slaves of America over here to help build a new world. But what was, what's the starting point of slavery over here? The starting point is the year that the English-speaking people got involved with the Atlantic slave trade because there was so much money involved. And you had nations like France, Spain, Portugal. They were running this huge profit of the Atlantic slave trade in human being, in black flesh. But the English speaking people, because they had come over here and set up colonies to get away from the so-called religious oppression of the Catholic Church and, 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 and other organizations, they had no legitimate religious right that they could point to to get involved with the uh, Atlantic slave trade. So this is what they needed. And how did they accomplish this? How did the English-speaking people get involved with the Atlantic slave trade? It come about this way. Some of your most brilliant minds in England was Sir John Sir uh, uh, Francis Bacon, King James, William Shakespeare. So what happened is that the uh, 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 version of the Bible that we call the King James version of the Bible was interpreted in the English language. And to justify slavery, they misinterpret the concept, the, the, the portion in Genesis that they read to justify the enslavement of the descendants of Ham. They, they, they know now that that was a mistranslation that they did on purpose. And the reason that they did this is that this gave the English-speaking people the legitimate religious right to get in on the Atlantic slave trade, the huge profit in peddling human flesh. What was the year? What was the year of the King James Version of the Bible? The year 1611. So the year 1611 is the year the English-speaking people got involved with the Atlantic slave trade. This is the beginning of prophecy of Genesis 15, 13, that uh, when Abraham is told that his descendants should be in a land that's not theirs and dwell in this land, be enslaved in this land for 400 years. That was the starting point, 1611. Now, I know you can do a little math. If you take 1611 and add 400, you get the year 2011. And what I'm telling you here is that the year 2011 would be the end of the 400 years of slavery. So the descendants of Abraham, the sign of Jonah that we have over here now, is still, from a scriptorial point of view, under that 400 years of slavery that would, that would end the year 2011. Very important to keep that point in mind. See? Now, another point that I want you to keep in mind, especially uh, on the western section of the United States of America, we have so much madness and gangbanging and confusion among the Hispanic and among the African American. The thing that you must keep in mind is that when you trace the history of both the Hispanics and the African American that you have out here banging heads each other, fighting over a hood that they don't own uh, uh, one block in, 
You see that anybody that speaks the Spanish language got almost 800 years of Islam in their background. But look at, look at what happened now. In the year 1492, when Ferdinand and Isabel kicked all of the Muslims and Jews out of Spain, see Spain, that has been the educational uh, uh, center. This was a, who educated uh, the European nations, was Spain. But in the year 1492, Isabel and Ferdinand kicked all the Muslims and Jews out, forced those that stayed behind to convert to Catholicism. And so, as a result of this, because when you look at the, uh, uh, the, the Hispanics, who are the Hispanics? The Hispanics are the descendants of the Spaniards and the Native American females over here that they mix with to uh, 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 produce the Hispanics, the one that we call the, the Mexicans. Now, so there, with 800 years of Islam that they gave up for the Babylonian uh, uh, religious system, and uh, like I say, the gloves have to come off, so I got to let you know, and, and as we continue to talk, I'm going to lay it out and show you that the Catholic Church is the Babylonian religious system. There's too much information out here now to prove that you got a uh, 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 Scripture in front of you, when you got the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation that clearly points out who this Babylonian mystery of iniquity is, this Babylonian religious system.